one. Matt Hutter wasn't the first guest we've ever had on on this broadcast, a podcast, ten years ago, but he was darn close. Uh, and he's been with us talking hockey for just about every one of those ten years since uh, 2009. Uh, and he was with us right. He started with us right when the Red Wings started uh, to kind of project downward. But there was still a lot to talk about in those years. They were still making the playoffs. They were still they saw some pretty good teams. They just weren't quite as good as those cup winning teams uh, earlier in the decade. But mm -hmm. uh, there was always something to talk about the Red Wings uh, for the years that we had Matt on. Yeah, we were all big show. time bloggers way back then. You know? Yeah, yes. Matt, Matt was uh, doing his thing with Bleacher Report, and, and uh, was uh, you know he was a frequent guest with us, of course. And, yes. And uh, when when um, when the Steve Eisman news broke, uh, Matt came out of the woodwork and. <laughs> gave me all caps, an all caps uh, excited uh, text, and then I said, "Well, why don't you come on? We're having a, you know, we're having a ten year anniversary show coming up pretty soon. Why don't you, you know, save some of that enthusiasm for then?" And he said, "I think I can do it." And he is. He's here with us on the other end of our line from Oregon, Matt Hutter. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, we're thrilled. Um, you know. Without, I'm not going to sit in a wax nostalgic with you because uh, we did that before we recorded. But <laughs> mm -hmm. I will say that I, I, when Al and I were on this, uh, talking on the show last episode, I had, we brought up your name actually because because in the, in the wake of the Eisenman news, I, I was saying that it, I said, Al, I said, didn't it seem like whenever we would talk about Eisenman coming back to the Red Wings, it, it was mm -hmm. always a, first of all a pipe dream, it seemed like, yeah. and secondly, I said Matt Hutter would always tell us. Guys, he's got four years left. Guys, he's got three yeah. years left, and and and, and it seemed like it was, it just seemed like it was always so far away, and here it is. It actually happened, and 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 so Matt, um, you know, obviously by your all caps text to me, uh, you were very pleased. But uh, now that it's now that it's been almost a month now, it's kind of sunken in a little yeah. bit. What does this really mean for the franchise going forward? Have you have you after, after you got over the initial enthusiasm and excitement, you look at this from a hockey standpoint, uh, purely hockey, um, why is this still in your mind such a good move, taking away the emotion? Yeah. Uh, I, I think ultimately, or simply, now's an opportunity to really um, build uh, a, a new culture, but in a way that's very attached to you know, the tradition of the team and, and of, of management and the, and the way that they've made it, their decisions in the past, because not only was Steve a player, but he was, you know, uh, uh, in the front office prior to him going to Tampa Bay. But Steve Eiserman is a GM who understands how to build a modern hockey team. And aside from, you know, just, just the amazing thing of, of kind of Detroit's favorite son coming back to lead, uh, to lead the team, uh, it, he is a modern-day GM in a way that I just felt over the past several seasons uh, Ken Holland was not. Um, and I think that is, uh, again, emotion aside, it's an opportunity for the team to really kind of come into a new era that, frankly, I think has been delayed because of, um, of an old culture that just wasn't working anymore. Now let's talk about that. Uh, it's interesting that you say winning culture because obviously the, the team had been in the playoffs for 24, 25 years in a row or whatever, and, yeah. and they've been out of the playoffs for, I think, three now. So um, what does what, when you say winning culture, what does that mean to you when, it come, when you're talking about a franchise that only just recently has had a winning culture? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I don't know if I was referring to a, a winning culture winning culture in the sense that they haven't had one um but what it takes to win and build a winner now is different than what it took years ago and and i think when you look back to you know certain you know certain things that happen in the history of your team kind of just stick with you just the uh i remember geez i think this was 2013 uh ken holland made a deal for david leguan uh for uh cali yarn <laughs> right yeah <laughs> um why? Well, because we got to keep the streak alive, right? And I think at the time I wrote a piece kind of just uh, justifying the logic of that. But in hindsight, you know, you know, Yarn Crocs become, you know, uh, if not a core piece, at least a very important piece of the Nashville Predators. Uh, I actually interviewed that kid when uh, he was drafted in 2010 um, and, and could have been a, a key piece for a new Wings team moving forward. But instead he was traded for what turned out to be more or less a bag of pucks. 
um, so they could, you know, stay de- stay the decline. Uh, but to what end uh, for first round exit? So, you know, that kind of, you know, where the Red Wings were in the playoffs, I, I think that's a that's a good goal to set. Um, but when that's the end in itself and not the means to winning a cup, um, then I then I think that you know it, it doesn't really. Uh, it, it doesn't move the team forward in a way that it needs to. And, and again, I mean, you look at, uh, not talk on the past, but signings, you know, and re-signings of guys like Danny Cleary, uh, yeah. you know, yes. uh, uh, Eric Cole, you know, these, this old, you know, let's get the old dogs in and see what mm-hmm. happens. It's like, you know, no, it's nobody does that anymore. Yeah, that doesn't right. really, that doesn't work, you know, and those that do regret it. Right. Um, I think of, uh, like, uh, uh, Oh, jeez. Blanking on his name right now. He's in Edmonton just on this Albatross contract. Uh, um, uh, yeah, Milan Lucic, right? Uh, you know, mm-hmm. the guy that came in and they figured, oh, you know, could build, you know, build some veteran identity in the locker room. That's just, you know, if you look at the teams that are surviving now in the playoffs uh, and, and moving forward, you know, in, in Boston obviously has a lot of veterans, uh, but they have a lot of great, skilled young players, and they've kind of uh, rebuilt – around that younger core. So I think that's that's the culture that I think uh, Steve Eisenman will bring into a team that um, maybe has spoken to that and tried to do what they can. And we, I think this season we saw some <clears throat> some players uh, really start start to come in their own. I think there's a lot yet to prove. Uh, but, to, but to make sure that that core is what you were built around and then add the best pieces you can around that um, not because you can get them on the cheap and they're an old aging player, uh, but because you, you, you see that they're going to complement that core moving forward. So, Well, you know, we've been, we've been critics of, of Kenny's, all three of us, uh, and at times, but I, I, I believe, um, Matt, that, you know, Steve Eisman is too smart. He's too wise of a hockey man. He's not one to, um, not that he, not that he uh, dismisses the, the emotional tug of having been a Red Wing all those years, and not that he poo-poos that, but he's also not one, I don't think, to make decisions solely based on his heart. And I, saying all that to say that, I'm not sure that he would have come back here if this situation was a mess. And I don't think he's coming yeah. into a mess. And I think he realizes that Ken uh, may have taken a little longer than we would have liked, but I think he, I think he sees, Steve sees, talent uh, on the NHL roster, and he sees uh, a pipeline of talent coming in uh, that's not in, the, not in the NHL yet, and I think he sees uh, that he, it is set up quite nicely for somebody like him to come in, and uh, I, I don't think he would come here uh, if he thought this was a train wreck. Uh, I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. And, and it, again, if, if he was making decisions on his heart, Perhaps he never would have left, or perhaps right, he would have true. been more effort to kind of, you know, before Ken Holland was re-signed the last time, uh, I believe it was a four-year contract, uh, you know, that, that he would have, uh, you know, he would have made some efforts then. No, no, I agree. And, and again, this isn't to uh, completely uh, dismiss Ken Holland. I mean, Ken Holland's done more for the Detroit Red Wings, more good for the Detroit Red Wings uh, by far than he's done harm. And it's, and it's not so much a, you know... Uh, a criticism of of his ability uh, as, a, as a GM per se, but just t- to be a GM uh, as he did take over in '98 of a of a team who just won a cup, who had an incredible core around them, and kind of just keep that train moving. That's a different skill set than all of those pieces fall away. The game changes, literally. Uh, you know what what creates uh, 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 talent around the team changes. Um, you know, much, much younger uh, youth, uh, youth-focused youth style of play now across all the teams. Uh, that's a lot for one GM to keep up with who'd been there for, uh, you know, 20-plus years. So you've got, uh, you've got a necessary uh, need to, to have, you know, uh, new ideas and, and just a new way of thinking and, and to have, again, someone in Eisenman who has built um, and when he took over, uh, Tampa Bay was not uh, a powerhouse team, uh, but built up a powerhouse team in the modern, uh, what I call the modern era. Uh, I think, regardless of who, you know who it is, uh, that's a tremendous boost to this this hockey club. 
We're talking with Matt Hutter, our um, longtime NHL and uh, Red Wing uh, insider, and we're uh, pleased to have him back here with us on our 10th anniversary show of the Knee Jerks. I'm Greg Eno, and uh, let's bring back Al in here. What you got for Matt? Well, uh, speaking of the rebuild, and uh, we see there are some pieces in place, uh, uh, specifically the big four of Larkin, Anthony C.U., Mantha, and uh, Bertuzzi. Uh, but mm-hmm. there are some big needs, and if you notice, one of those, na- uh, what's not mentioned in those names is a defenseman. So what do you think is yep. the bigger need for this team, especially coming in this draft, even though I'm not sure there's a defenseman worth taking, uh, that high is the pick wings. Well, uh, are they... Is, is a defenseman right now, a top-pairing defenseman, I should say, a bigger need for this team than someone who can put the puck in the net? Because that's also been an issue for this team. Yeah. Uh, well, I think the needs are, you know, kind of all through the offense, defense. Mm-hmm. Uh, we could talk about goaltending if you like, but let's leave that aside for now. Yep. Uh, yeah. No, I think, you know, the defense, uh, both for what is needed now Mm-hmm. And what is uh, needed for the future, I think, is the biggest, uh, the, you know, the biggest hole to fill. Uh, you know, when you've got, you know, you've got Cronwall, who, who had a above average season, I think, relative to where he's been, um, is it, still maybe argue, arguably your most reliable defenseman. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and no, no, uh, no disrespect to him at all. That's a that's a problem. If if if. If, if you're facing that as a hockey team. So, you know, I think there's a need to improve as immediately as possible. And I've seen some, I can't recall what the outlet was, but there was a suggestion, uh, it might have been Detroit Free Press, that, you know, maybe they should trade Mantha for, you know, a, a younger defenseman. Um, okay, but and now you're giving away a piece of your core. I don't understand the need well, look, to, just to, follow to do up that. On that just, uh, there's been another suggestion thrown out there is that uh, Jacob Truba, local kid who wants out of Winnipeg, yep. is going to be a restricted free agent, but he would cost a handful of draft picks as compensation. Is that someone right. worthwhile getting? Because he won't be cheap, but he's also young, and he's a top, and he's a top guy. It would, would that make sense? I, I mean, I think, yeah, that would make sense. I mean, when you look at um, when you look at the young core that you have and the young core that you have in the system, mm-hmm. um, and, you know, it, and, uh, you know, there's certainly no uh, huge blue chip uh, defensive prospects currently in the system, but, you know, you got to look at, you got to, you got to improve as you can now. Mm-hmm. So giving away some picks as they've stockpiled so many over the past few seasons, uh, to get someone like True, but I, I think that does make sense. But again, the numbers have to make sense, the term right. and all of that other stuff too, because uh, I think that's been another thing that's hampered this team. You know, again, not to harp on the past, but you got a Justin Advocator who looks to be very much a bust at this point, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, and long term contract another four years uh, for him, and oh, uh, unless oh, it's oh. dramatic turnaround, mm-hmm. yeah, that's that's not a good thing for the Detroit Red Wings. But if you deal with a cap, they have over 13, I think it's 13.9 million in projected cap space. So they are not, uh, you know, they are not uh, right up against it. And they, they have some money to spend without giving up uh, core roster players. So I think if those deals emerge, I think those do make sense. And, and to be a little bit more uh, liberal with uh, the draft picks, uh, mm-hmm. if, if it's to get uh, a top four defender, uh, who's maybe in or about to enter, uh, potentially into their prime, I think uh, makes a ton of sense. Matt, do you see, um, speaking of Coach Blaschel, uh, who of course just got a, a two-year uh, extension, which is not a long extension by any stretch of the imagination, but when we talked about Steve Eisman not not you know, making decisions with his heart or with emotions, he certainly, the way he handled the Martin St. Louis situation in Tampa was, was indicative of that. Uh, do you think that um, with he not having, I know he said all the right things in the press conferences and nice things about Jeff Blaschel, I get it, but how much patience do you think, uh, or do you think he, Steve's got so much on his plate in terms of getting this roster where he needs it to be that maybe the coaching situation is even further down the list than a lot of people would think would be? That's a great, great question. I mean, um, you know, Steve had made some comments uh, it was either at the press conference or later on in the press about the relationship that he sees between Blashill and Larkin. Um, not that they're best buds, but that he sees that there's there's a respect there that uh, that Blashill is is uh, you know trusting him with 
I, you know, I think the worst kept secret is, is, is he'll be named captain at some point, if not over the summer, then maybe at the beginning of the season. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that that relationship is really, really important um, for building a team. And, and clearly, Eisenman knows of what he speaks. Uh, him and Scotty Bowman were, were also not best buds, um, mm-hmm. but, uh, but I think there was enough mutual respect there and, and a vision for where he wanted both Steve and the team to go in order to win uh, that Steve sees the importance of that. So in that case, I would say that, you know, maybe ultimately it's Larkin's continued development and Larkin's um, relationship with Blashill that'll uh, speak more to Blashill's longevity here than than the team's record. Uh, because the logic there, I think, is if you can get your best player, the guy you're building around, to buy into what the coach's uh, is, vision is, uh, then the rest of the players, you know, follow suit and all of a sudden you're building... Uh, a consistent team uh, built around a strong identity of, of how uh, how they're going to execute and, and and eventually you know at least theoretically the wins come after that um, but but yeah you know if I could imagine that Steve Eisen would look across all the things that um, that the team needs and I, I would be shocked if he saw that coaching was uh, at the very top of that list at this point yeah I, I tend to agree with you there uh, I want to kind of switch gears while while we have you because we don't get a chance to talk to you very often, and I, want, I just want to ask you a kind of a non Red Wing question. Of, although it yeah. is related, uh, Mike Babcock, uh, from what I'm reading uh, out of Toronto, is um, I wouldn't say he's in any jeopardy of losing his job, but he is. Uh, it's a little bit rocky over there right now. They're, 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 as you know, that fan base they haven't won a Stanley Cup in 52 years. Um, you know, he's brought. I think he, I think personally that Babcock has done what he was hired to do, which was to bring the Leafs back into relevance. Obviously, Austin Matthews didn't hurt, but they, it's not just Matthews. Yeah. They got a lot of young, younger players. Uh, he's he he meaning Babcock has brought them back into relevance. They're strong contenders every year. They haven't had the playoff success that, of course, uh, the, the fans there would like to have. But now I'm reading that uh, there's there might be some some. Um, Butting heads between he and management, not so much Brendan Shanahan, but the general manager. Um, yeah. What What do you make of this? Is this just Babcock being Babcock, or will we see um, will we see Babcock become uh, one of these big name coaches that's going to be available pretty soon? And would he ever come yeah, back to Detroit under, under Steve Eiserman, which is yeah. even more amazing? Yeah. No. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm read, yeah. I'm oh, that's like a crazy. I'm some of the some of the same thing. You, you know, I mean. Toronto is such a difficult one to handicap because that's a team and a fan base that whether they go, you know, win a Stanley Cup or they have a 0 and 82 season, uh, every game is sold out. Right. Every team, you know, every every version of the roster is equally, you know, uh, believed in by the fan base, and it's just so right. there's an irrationality to that fan base and perhaps the organization itself uh, that I think really kind of clouds. Uh, one's judgment, but you know, I, I, it, it would certainly appear based on I think even the realistic expectations uh, that you know this is the season for Babcock to kind of push them over the cliff, and that if they're not going into the second or third rounds uh, with that talent, which is mind-boggling when you think of it, uh, that talent throughout the lineup from Mitch Marner to obviously Tavares is there now, um, right. Uh, you mentioned Austin Matthews. That's a team that should be challenging um, very soon for a Stanley Cup. Um, it can't be Boston. Not a lot of weaknesses there. They can't be Boston. Yeah, well. they can't, can't be Boston. <laughs> yeah, and you know, and, and and can't seem to get past the loss of a guy like Kadri, who's an important piece of that team. Makes a stupid play, gets ejected, and mm-hmm. they kind of are never able to recover from that. Um, but, uh, you know, yeah, when you have a roster like that, you can't look at that and say, well, management's really got more work to do. They, they haven't been mm-hmm. pulling their weight. Right. Management's done a fantastic job of delivering yeah. a really top-notch roster. So I think when that's the case, then you have to start looking at the coaching and wondering, is this the right guy? Is it the right voice? And, again, it gets back to what kind of relationship does Austin Matthews have with Mike Babcock. And mm-hmm. during the season, there were – you know, not too quiet uh, talk about uh, that there's been some clutches there. Uh, and I think, you know, when you look at any kind of player-coach combination uh, that have been successful, uh, as I've said before, it's not, uh, you know, not best buddies just in lockstep all the time. The conflict right. is necessary. But if that becomes 
distracting to the player and or the coach, then obviously that becomes distracting to the team, and then you've then you've got a whole much bigger problem to deal with. Uh, so, you know, Babcock is who he is. He's an extremely mm-hmm. intense guy, as you know. Uh, you know, he is not going to deviate from his right. best sense of how to run that team. Right, and, 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 and every, you know, every great coach, if you, look at, if you look at a lot of the great coaches uh, in, in the NHL, throughout NHL history, they, they, they've, many of them have had a stop in their career where it just didn't work. And I, I, when you think about Scotty yeah. Roman with Buffalo, Buffalo just didn't work in yep. Buffalo. He had some good teams in Buffalo, uh, good regular season teams, didn't quite do, do in the playoffs what he did with Montreal, but then he did it with the Penguins when he filled in for Bob Johnson. And then, of course, he did it with the Red Wings ultimately, uh, although it took him a few you know, misfires in Detroit before he got that right. Yep. <laughs> so, I mean, there's always that there's always that stop where even the great coaches just don't can't really get it done. And so far... With Babcock, at least in the playoffs, it's been Toronto because he has been able to get out of the first round in, in, the, in the last three seasons there uh, with, like you said, a very good roster and with obviously very good regular season records. So it'll be interesting to see you know, how that shakes yeah. up. But before we let you go, and I don't know. But, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say just, just real quick, and also we've seen that there's, I think, a legitimate uh, concern about the, his ability to win game seven. Um, the, and any, yeah, we've experienced that. Or you know, that's, well, yeah. that's. I guess that's fair. I mean, uh, I suppose that's fair because you look back. He lost Game Seven as Anaheim coach in the finals. He lost a couple of Game Sevens in Detroit. Well, at least one in the finals and against against yep. uh, Pittsburgh in '09. Well, and that I, brings. Oh, well, just one sec, Greg. If in that the last two years against Boston. Huh? Mm-hmm. Well, let me ask you this. Then doesn't the, uh, Matt? Does this bring up the argument that you could say Mike Babcock is overrated as a coach? least something. <laughs> Think about it. Uh, he, you, you could argue yeah. he should have won at least one more cup with the Wings. And he had his yeah. playoff issues here as well. And now he's, yep. he's hearing the same sorts of things in Toronto. I mean, he's he, I mean, he guy's got a track record, but he's also got a track record, as you said, of some major playoff failures. Yeah. I, I I wouldn't go on the record saying that I think he's an overrated <laughs> coach. Um, uh, far be it for me to do that. No, I you know, I think you know, again, he is a coach who has a philosophy, who has a way that he goes about running his club, mm-hmm. uh, running his team on the ice. And, you know, he will let success or failure determine his fate, uh, which, you know, you have to respect that. He is yeah. not going to adjust and deviate to save his job uh, or to appease a fan base or even management. So, but, but yeah, when you look at the Game 7, um, uh you know, history, you know, if one were looking for, well, maybe maybe there's an element to his style and his coaching mm-hmm. that it, it just it can't quite pull a team together uh, in what's a, a very tense and very emotional uh, game experience of, of, of trying to close out a series. And uh, I, I think it takes a special, special type of player, special type of coach to really kind of consistently step up and deliver that and you know in in different rounds and in, in in the biggest uh in games uh when the cup's on the line uh babcock's been been uh spotty in his ability to lead a team to that success well that's true but uh i mean the, the regular season one loss record uh, pretty much speaks for itself and, and the fact frankly yep. that he got, that he got that 2003 uh ducks team to the finals is amazing i know they wrote they wrote the coattails a lot of de bear uh not de bear uh uh, Giger. Was, was it Giger. Giger? Yeah. Was it Giger? Giger, uh, yeah. The goalie, yeah. The goalie uh, to, the, to, to that, but still, I mean, uh, you know, and, and frankly, I, you know, as far as coaching goes, I, you know, I can, I, I can only speak to what happened in 2008 when he, uh, Babcock, uh, pulled Dominic, no, he didn't pull him out of the game, but he, he went from Dominic Koshik mm-hmm. to Chris Osgood uh, mm-hmm. after yep. the first two games of the first round against Nashville. Because um, you just, uh, maybe it was after game four. It was after the first four games. It was 2 2. Uh, Hashi yeah, kept bad games in Nashville. Not, yeah. And he said, Look, the puck, yeah. I, remember, I remember Babcock saying, The puck's going in that too much. And uh, so he pulled the Hall of Fame goalie, put, put in uh, <laughs> yeah. for game five. And, you know, the rest is they went on and they, they wrote his. Uh, and to Osgood's credit, he's borderline Hall of Fame. So you go from a Hall of Fame goalie to a borderline Hall of Fame. So those so. are the kind of decisions, uh, Matt, that mm-hmm. I submit to you, not every NHL coach would make. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. anyway, well, we got to let you go. Thanks again for, for helping us spend our 10th anniversary show with us and, uh, and uh, continued success out there in Oregon and what you're doing. And, uh, yeah. 
let's 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 not be let's not be strangers again. Agreed. No, it was great talking to you guys. All right, take right. care. Okay. Bye. All right.